to welcome uh, Henry Hopwood Phillips to the uh, podcast. We're discussing his article for The Critic magazine called Russian Orthodoxy on Trial. And Henry, before we begin, I think I would like to just read a little bit of the comments of Patriarch Kirill about Symphonia, because this is a sort of ancient concept and its application in the modern day is something that you discuss at length in your article, and it's a hotly debated topic. It really implicates what is going on with the war in Ukraine. I think before we begin, it's a, it's a good idea to, uh, to hear the words of Kirill himself. So, <clears throat> quote, The Russian Orthodox Church has gone through the hardest path of many historical events, difficulties, and Symphonia was out of the question when, by the will of state authorities, the Patriarchate was abolished. It was out of the question when the government became the persecutor of the church. Under the new conditions, we are aware of the impossibility of realizing this ideal of Symphonia, which was born in the first millennium. But on the other hand, we as a church are aware of the need for the spirit of Symphonia to guide our thoughts and actions in building a model of church-state relations. We live in a modern democratic state, and our brothers and sisters who live in other states, and there are many of them among us, also exist in that system of law, which is generally recognized today. The principles which are also universally recognized are those which are laid down in our state constitution. Therefore, the spirit of symphonia, but not the letter, must realize itself within that legal framework and on the basis of those constitutional provisions that exist. This opens up a wonderful prospect for the development of church-state relations in such a way that neither the state nor the church, without interfering in each other's affairs, would mutually respect each other's position on these internal matters and simultaneously build up a broad system of interaction, dialogue, and cooperation. This is the case today in Russia and in many other states where the Russian Orthodox Church performs its ministry. Now, as we are both Orthodox Christians uh, affiliated in various ways with the Moscow Patriarchate, I was very interested, Henry, by your article because it seemed to call into question these remarks of Patriarch Kirill. Well, I think my thesis can boil down to a, quite a simple remark, which is essentially that Russia considers itself in some way the successor to the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire. Um, and that probably would be okay if many boxes had been ticked that probably haven't been ticked. And I would claim that Russian, the Russian identity isn't the same as the Roman one. I bang on on Twitter all the time saying how the Roman identity is baggy enough to contain all peoples because it's truly imperial, whereas the Russian rapper seems to create some form of Russian nationalism. Now, there's there's Byzantine scholarship by people like uh, Caldelis, who would probably say, actually, the Romans were just as nationalist. Um, I th personally think that's going... He's overcorrecting scholarship that basically claimed orthodoxy and Romanitas were the same rapper. People like Oblensky used to claim that the Byzantine Commonwealth uh, was orthodoxy and vice versa. And so Caldelis is kind of coming in and mowing him down with a scythe. Um, but uh, the, the second point would be essentially that I think it's okay to lead the Orthodox churches if you seem to be pursuing, uh, let's just say, a Christian agenda. And I think far too many of Russia's actions prove that it's kind of trying to be the bully boy of, of the playground rather than guide uh, as a as a as a proper minister would the flock uh, as the EP the Ecumenical Patriarch has historically done and has you know millennia of history behind him in doing so rather wisely. Um, I think. There's just a major clash at the moment within orthodoxy about authority. On the one hand, the Russians have the people and the money, and the ecumenical patriarchy has um, this long tradition of primacy um, and essentially historical precedent behind it. And those two forms of authority are clashing. And quite frankly, Russia's metrics on power shouldn't matter within a truly Christian framework. 
And so there's actually a number of issues that you raise in the article. One is something you just evoked, which is this difference between the imperial and the nationalist project, which we should yeah. return to. But I was wondering if you could expound uh, briefly on what is Symphonia, because, you know, in the history of Orthodox Christianity or in Christianity writ large, Christians have lived under a number of regimes and various territories uh, under various sorts of political economy. And Symphonia seems to be a, a sort of particularly Byzantine arrangement where the state and the church could be said to to complement each other in, in a way where they're they're acting in concert, you know, which is evoking this symphonic relationship. Do you um, do, do sure. you have something that you would like to to, to expound on that? Um, well, I, I guess the West is built upon the the idea that you should separate the powers. Um, I don't think it's as foreign as many people like to pretend this idea of symphonia where the body and mind are one, the hand and the glove are one. Um, it's just, you know, call it, you know, Chinese, you might call it yin and yang. Um, but I think within the, the, I say it's not particularly foreign to people because I think if you actually look at the Anglican tradition, uh, right at home here in Britain, we have the kind of queen being some form of governor of the Church of England and you have the bishop sitting in parliament. Um, now that you could argue would sit fairly comfortably within the concept of uh, symphonia. Um, it's just this idea of harmony, essentially between the secular and the religious arms. And it's the idea that, now it might be idealistic, it might be rarely ever properly adhered to, but it's my, my view that ideals matter. They police what is a transgression and what is not a transgression. And so if even if um, Byzantine politics rarely fulfilled the ideal, it didn't mean that the ideal should ever be shunned. Um, and I think that's what pushes forward. I don't know. I, I guess that's that to me is great, and that should be pushed forward. But I think the way that Russia... Russia is dealing with this concept with this, you know, this, this quote of Kirill you've just, uh, just outlined, I think is that it's used as a kind of fig leaf. It's used as a fig leaf for uh, essentially being in each other's pockets, but not in the Christian sense, but, it, and that's why they're proud of using it. They're happy to use it because it's almost taking the, the operations, the functions of symphonia, but, uh, vacuuming out the Christian content. So it's the form and, and sucks out the content and, and fills it with this kind of totalitarianism, this kind of authoritarianism. So the proper relationship in a sort of Byzantine symphony would be that the political authority is sufficiently influenced by the church informally. So the church yes. is not directly legislating, it's not directly ruling, but no. that the church has been so effective in evangelizing the culture that the political authority is essentially uh, working according to those teachings without exactly. having to be directly ordained. And what we see in Russia is something like the opposite, that the church has been so influenced by secular concerns yep. that it's operating in concert with whatever, you know, Putin's regime or whatever you want to phrase it, the Russian state, its own interest. Yes. With, so it's it, it's a sort of a sinister inversion of this Byzantine concept. I'm interested primarily in this discussion, not so much as evaluating Byzant Byzantine symphonia for whatever its merits mm. or demerits were, because it's a, you know, a system of social relations that's long gone, but no. rather what does... Kirill or, or Putin or any of these figures, what do they, they seek to do here? Because, you know, Russia is not an empire. It's a nation state. It's a sort of greatly reduced, a weak, fragile social order. Who are they trying to convince with this language of symphonia? Is this something that's directed to Orthodox internationally to say, look, we are leaders? Is this something directed to Orthodox nationally saying, look, we are or good Orthodox? What, what, what do you think is the social function of this claim, this sort of pretension to symphonia? I think it's a legitimizing device both within the state in the sense that the state persecuted Orthodoxy for so long, you know, um, 
kind of seven to 12 million dead under the communists. And I think this complete reversal means that you bring on side a huge slice of your um, population. I I would actually disagree with your idea that it's just a nation state. I actually think, funnily enough, it's. I, I would agree with you that it's in very reduced straits. I, I, the only reason I would pick at the other statement is that, in a very weird way, Russia is still an empire in the sense that it has huge minorities. Not in no, sense- that's true. That's I'll concede that. That's true. I was imprecise. <laughs> uh, I just think there's so many ethnic minorities that, and they are actually they tend to be orthodox. Um, mm-hmm. Whether that's due to just historical imperialism or just great missionary endeavors, um, I think. I think the social function of Symphonaire also has a foreign policy element to it. And I think that's essentially that if you cast the West in terms of decadence, uh, usually liberal decadence, then having this kind of Byzantine gloss, if you like, provides you with a kind of Christian core that will... And it's, it's very poisonous to me because it blends truth with lies. And that to me mm-hmm. is like more dangerous than lies, right? Mm-hmm. Because I think, I do think true renaissances throughout the world will come from people turning to Christianity and living it out. Um, and I think, I, I do believe that we live in some form of renaissance within the West. Um, but the idea that the solution is reactionary Christian conservatism in some kind of steroid, you know, this kind of, yeah, on Christianity on steroids in a very, you know, within liberal Christianity, we used to have um, Gladstone and people like that saying they wanted muscular Christianity and things like that. I think mm. this is the Russian version of that. And I think it talks to a certain emptiness, if you like, because Christianity Christianity's muscularity isn't in any form of uh, aggression or physique or any of the formal formal definitions of power. It's it's its power has always been in upturning and overturning conventional forms of power. Mm-hmm. Um, that true power is is the life of Christ, which is utterly foreign to all of our formal definitions of power and i think that's what really gets me about russia at the moment is it kind of sells the christian package whilst again emptying of its of its uh, contents i mean if we're being very blunt it's it's very perverse and disgusting that the patriarch of moscow and all rus would you know clap his hands while his uh quote-unquote partners are just destroying his own churches, killing his own flock. I mean, what kind of shepherd cheers on the wolf? To me, it's an obscenity. You it's, mean with Ukraine, as in the wolf? Yeah, it's it's completely absurd. I mean, there. I, I just saw this morning uh, some a beautiful monastery or church. I forget exactly which building it was. Just blown to bits, you know. Mm-hmm. And and think about. I mean, I don't know how it was in Britain, but here in France, I see Ukrainian people every day and new people. It's not the same people. People are arriving every day. And how, how are we supposed to talk about this? How am I supposed to share the gospel with these people? You know, how, how am I supposed to even speak to them? We're speaking the language of the people that are coming to destroy their lives, to, to kill their family, to steal whatever they have. It's, I mean, I, I, I talk to people on the street and they just start breaking down crying. It's a, it's a, and, and for me to have Patriarch Kirill sitting there and just kind of intoning these the sort of pablum about oh well the west they have gay parades like <laughs> this this insane slaughter i don't know i, I mean I, i'm not here to to make some kind of moral contest about who can get to denounce the invasion more but it's just to me something that that really struck me in your piece was just the clarity of the the ridiculousness of the whole affair it doesn't make any sense yeah i think I think it's a civil war on more dimensions than just the Slavic element. I think it's a civil war within um, orthodoxy. And I think that's what's been so scarring about all of this is I shouldn't have to go and type up a piece that essentially um, traduces the the tradition I come from. I, I shouldn't be needing to do that. Uh, I didn't want to do it, to be frank. Mm-hmm. Um 
I have my own, I have my own kind of tradition that I come from and, and people that I'm connected to who probably wouldn't have wanted me to write that. And um, I think, I think the fact that people are die Orthodox people are dying trumps any social relations or social loyalty, to be frank. I mean, if we're uh, supposed to have any honor or dignity. Yeah. I, I just appreciate that you've brought this analysis on a theological level rather than a purely geopolitical level, because this is something that really needs to be contended with. We have, especially in the West, especially in America, it seems like a lot of people who understand that, you know, I'm living with no form of life. I'm just a kind of uh, listless consumer, et cetera, et cetera. And they glom on to this sort of, as you mentioned, this reactionary conservative ideal of, well, there's this holy Russia. I could join that. I could have a culture. I could have a sense of place. I could have faith. But yeah. they're, they're joining something that is, frankly, it's an antichrist. I mean, what's going on? It's it's. Uh, I think this is. The, I think this is why Orthodox is suffering so much at the moment. Is is you get people who are cleaving to the Orthodox faith as a form of meaning, as you say, from um, from mean essentially materialist nihilism. Um, and I think, I think we had we saw people like that in the hippie movements, the new the new age stuff, right? And mm -hmm. the problem is, is if you build up stuff just sheerly as a reaction to what you dislike, and you idolize whatever's built, you know, it used to be Hin new age Hinduism, for example, or mm. tantric stuff. Well, how long did it last realistically? You know, ten years among the norms, the normies, twenty years among the hardcore. What, what really exists of it today, barely 0.1% of what existed in the 60s. Now, I think uh, if you are truly Orthodox Christian, what's funny is you actually don't want what I would call the new ages of Orthodoxy, the people who are in it for the LARP, in it for mm -hmm. the, the, you know, grow an Athenite beard and have some really what you consider hardcore opinions. What's what's hilarious is if you, if you want... Um, these kind of opinions um, to, to be considered hard hitting. If you actually set them against any random desert father saying the desert father sayings are usually burning with far more love and in a way far, and they are far more radical than these hot takes. Uh, and I think that's what's sad is in the age of the kind of bon mot, you get people chasing these hot takes, but really missing the entire flipping point. Yeah. That's very true. I, I don't know if this occurred in Britain, but in the United States, there was a phenomenon in the 2000s called the Young, Ref Restless, and Reformed. And it was essentially a fad of people getting really into kind of uh, uh, strong Calvinist uh, soteriology, Calvinist theology, because, you know, you're a random evangelical in America and you don't really have a deep theology and you want to remain Protestant. You want to be faithful to that. And you start reading Calvin and, oh, there's this deep systematic exposition, et cetera, et cetera, and they glom onto it. And then today it's kind of like a something that people are a little bit uh, ashamed to admit that, that that's what they were doing, you know, in 2007 or whatever. And I think that I think that orthodoxy might be the same thing for a lot of people where they're like, yeah, you know, in 2018 I had a, a saint as my uh, Twitter avatar or whatever. I think it's uh, – I think it's really I, sad thing. I think where it, the, the first alarm bells for me were when I was, long before I was baptized, actually, I was, uh, as we talked about just before the podcast began, uh, I was a very long catechumen. And essentially, um, I was talking online about how I was struggling with Mariology um, and how I was kind of edging closer. It was hard, but I was getting through a lot of my... Um, let's say, crypto-Protestant qualms um, about it all. And it was just a journey for me. And I was just honest on Twitter about it being a journey. And, you know, it came, like, years later, like, when I was quibbling over some some of the finer points of theology with a random Orthodox chat, it just, I, I think I, I suffered my first pylon from the Orthodox right in the sense that they said, oh, look, this guy once struggled with Mariology, don't listen, he has no authority kind of thing. And I just thought, well, that's just everything that's wrong with the, you know, inverted commas, orthodox right. Um, this idea that is in a weird way, it's almost uh, just an inversion of wokeism. It's how dare you be blameless 
Uh, you know, if you're not blameless, you can have no authority, which again is not the Christian message. Well, actually, that's, that's a, a great um, segue to the question of Patriarch Kirill himself, because you know, I uh, when I came into Orthodoxy, I was attached to the Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, and over time here in West in France, we uh, were removed from Patriarch Bartholomew and found ourselves attached to. Uh, Patriarch Kirill, and uh, my girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife, told me repeatedly that uh, of all of Patriarch Kirill's misdeeds about his material corruption, about yeah. him being in bed with the Russian state and all these things. And I decided to go ahead and join the church anyway, because yeah. I respected and honored the people that were there for me when I was in need, essentially, because the Russian church in France was there for me and sort of pulled me out of a, a very bad way, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And because I had faith in them, I trusted their decision to affiliate with Moscow. Yeah. But I was never sort of ignorant or in denial about Patriarch Kirill's material corruption. To be honest with you, I kind of shrugged it off because, you know, politicians... Yeah, all these kind of figures, you know, business leaders, clergy at the highest levels. Okay, they have an affection for watches, whatever. It's not the most yeah. uh, serious crime possible. Yeah. But with this invasion of Ukraine and his sort of total capitulation, I, it's been a very it. I've thought I've reflected about this uh, at, at great length about what is really my relationship to this man and to this this organization, this institution, because I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you were following all the details of it, but I remember when he asked us to pray for Metropolitan Onofre in, in, in Ukraine and then Metropolitan Onofre pro uh, took the position directly antithetical to his own, you know? And I just, it's, it really draws in a question. What is the church? What is our relationship to these people? Why, why are, what does it mean that we're in communion with these people? Right. What does it mean that I'm in communion with Patriarch Kirill? You know, I think yeah. these are questions that we have to revisit throughout our lives. Well, so I'm, quite, I'm quite hardcore on that question. I do believe that people should be withdrawing from communion with Moscow. Mm. Um, I, I do think being in communion matters. It's not just a nice phrase. Um, I believe that if 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 you can if you can go to war with people who are identical to you on every level, let alone Christian level, and not expect any consequences, then that actually says something's rotten within the Orthodox Church. And I I don't th think you should go around throwing threats about communion willy-nilly. I, I think it's because it matters so much that it should be uh, loaded, weighted, and only done after long consideration. But I do think these things should be debated within the next great synod or something like that. Um, I think if we just kind of awkwardly look askance, then we are in some way complicit um, because who's to say something doesn't happen? I, I do believe it's almost like we're importing uh, all the most poisonous norms of the dysfun and dysfunctions of the Middle East, quite frankly, into, um, well, Russia's near abroad, and quite frankly... Uh, unpack what you mean by the dysfunctions of the Middle East. I'm not clear on what that means. Well, I meant Syria, essentially. Uh, the, oh, you uh, think that we're importing the, the politics of the Syrian civil war? Yeah, just in... Uh, what I mean is that sense that I don't want to become accustomed or, or numbed by the prospect of violence... Um, it's that kind of that that kind of dysfunction, um, you know. Even today, that um, Al Jazeera journalist was shot, and we just don't even know whose side she was shot by. And that's what brings alarm bells for me with the Ukrainian thing, because I, I just see both sides practicing disinformation um, quite a bit. You know, whether it's the ghost of Kiev on the on the Ukrainian side to reams of disinformation on the Russian side. I think what scares me most about the conflict is is postmodernity rattles your brain until you can't be bothered to think anymore or judge who's in the right. 
And I worry that if you don't have that silence and contemplation within orthodoxy that comes to a rather harsh decision to withdraw communion, then it all becomes, we almost fall into the trap of being pro-Russian by default. If you Mm -hmm. don't take a stand, you're pro-Russian in my view. Yeah, I understand that. And um, yeah, it's a very serious act to take. And I think it's something that everybody, especially all Orthodox, should take very seriously. Um, well, if we want to finish, I think I'd just like to say what we said in the intro, which was essentially that I believe that... You know what we should do? Hold on. We should, we should, what we should do is we should talk about the development of Symphonia historically, given that you are the Bi- Byzantine ambassador. <laughs> Can you well, do that? It's a difficult one because it's, you know what? It's almost like um, a fish doesn't have to think about the water that it's in. It's a kind of... It's an informal culture rather than an articulated principle. Uh, the, I actually plucked out, I think, Leo the Wise very rarely said something, and that's just because he was bloody garrulous and verbose in the first place. Um, but it's quite hard to... It's usually arced from Justinian as becoming somewhat explicit. It's articulated explicitly by Leo, and then it's just a guiding principle. Well, you should contrast that with Caesar or papism. Caesar papism is just essentially what what the Byzantines routinely get accused of. Um, Oh, you don't think it's an actual practice? It's more of an accusation. Yeah, exactly. It's actually bigotry from the West. It's the what about Henry VIII? Is that not Caesar or papism? Oh, sorry, I thought you meant directed at the Byzantines. Yeah, I just mean in general because you're talking about these. I think there's this question of the relationship with the re- religious and the secular that's been kind of suspended under liberalism. Yeah. Mm. You know, even in states like Mexico, where the Catholic Church is explicitly prohibited from engaging in political activity, they more or less have evangelical political parties, right? Everybody yeah. knows that it's the evangelical party, even though it's not legally established as such. Well, I think that's why I like Agamben, even though he's quite explicitly not Christian, is that he's constantly playing with this idea that there's power and then there's legitimacy. And mm-hmm. I think, and the two are permanent contenders in the sense that liberalism tries to to ban all talks, all talk of legitimacy, because that's essentially the playing field by which you define power and Mm. liberalism likes to just play with the tools of power and if you play with the tools of legitimacy then guess what liberalism can't claim to be the uh the fair umpire the fair arbitrator of contests because suddenly the playing field could be anything if if you believe that you know if you're uh, you as a libertarian believe one set of rules apply and i as a a, a Christian fundamentalist believe another. We b- both essentially have different eschatologies. You believe, mm-hmm. like th- th- person A believes in the Big Bang and ending in meaninglessness. The other person believes we were a speck in God's eye and we will end up in heaven. Now that might sound like empty theory to most people, but it determines everything about politics in your biological life. Mm-hmm. And I think. That's quite exciting for me, and for, that's why I read a lot of Agamben. Yeah. When it comes to the question of legitimacy with regard to the Moscow Patriarchate, I think there's this interesting issue of the canonical status of the Patriarchate. That is, it's sort of junior status. Yeah. You evoked at the beginning its numerical superiority in the sense that there's a lot more uh, you know, bodies uh, counted uh, sort of uh, attributed, assigned to the Moscow Patriarchate than there are, for example, to the Ecumenical Patriarch in Constantinople. Yeah. But it's not um, in any way, I mean, that's a completely secular measure. There's no reason, I, I, I don't think any theological reason as a Christian, we should care for the number of people in the seats, no? I mean, it, it seems to me there, there's this element of pretension with the, the way the Moscow Patriarchate conducts itself vis-a-vis the other patriarchs. In a, in a sort of pretending to this authority that it doesn't really have. Well, do you yeah. think that's an element of this whole conflict? Yeah, it constantly pretends that orthodoxy has to care about realpolitik as defined by those 
explicit formal power metrics when that's exactly what Christianity exists to reject. Mm-hmm. Um um don't get me wrong i don't want to come across as just solely critical of russia i actually think there's a problem with the ep in the sense that uh i understand criticisms that it is you know the candidate must be a turkish citizen um and the the, you know as, as you say the number of souls that it usually is in control of is so uh infinitesimal it's something like five to six thousand i think on average um but i do believe it's ironic that you bring it up because to me that's actually to to constantinople's credit yes it's it's sort of similar to the pope of rome and that it has this sort of autonomy by being so marginal you know i don't i don't have any illusions that uh i don't know the the government in Ankara is directing the Fanar. I don't. Yeah, I don't there's almost no, happens. there's almost no, uh, there's almost no th- um, vulnerabilities to to the whispering voice of power that you know telling you you are some kind of Faustian genius. Uh, I, no, mean, I, I could understand the argument that perhaps they would be susceptible to, I don't know, influence. They need protection or something like that. But I think the the desire for power is it's. Uh, I just don't see that when I look at Bartholomew. When I look at Bartholomew, I don't. I don't see somebody who's, you know, looking to play those kind of games. Listen, I think I disagree with the conservative tradition within the Orthodox Church that will eternally call Bartholomew Black Bart and all the rest of it. Um, but uh, the the Black Bart in the sense in the sense of just being this kind of eternal liberal Anglo kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. But I think that he, I think there is there are risks to weakness, and I think essentially Erdogan is not a neutral player in identity politics. Um, even today, I tweeted how he was building a mosque within the old fortress that surrounded the Byzantine Golden Gate, and that's just a kind of stamp of. Ottomanism on Byzantine monuments, literally just for the sake of it. Um, I think this is the problem is, is if Moscow has all the problems associated with formal power, Constantinople can attract some of the powers, uh, some, some of the weaknesses of, of political impotence. And that, you know, it's always within Erdogan's agenda to have a someone who will essentially bend to something when he needs it and that to be fair that is just the way the world is and i don't really complain about it but it is something to theologically consider well let's let's consider it briefly here before we go when i look at i mean i assume you're familiar with Plato's republic yeah so you're familiar in the section, I think it's in book six, I might be messing up the book number, about the, the question of the role of exile. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, Socrates talks about one of his uh, his friends who is some kind of cripple or gimp. And uh, he says it's to his, basically it's to his credit that he can attain to philosophy because given his physical infirmity, he is freed from all of the hustle and bustle of the political life, of business life, of all these things, right? Yeah. And and there's a discussion, a sort of digression about, you know, in order to save a young man from the affairs of the city, in order to preserve him for philosophy, one of the ways that you could do that would be to go into exile and intentionally take a marginal position to disdain the affairs of your own city, right? Yeah. And I think... This is a, a principal source of spiritual strength for the ecumenical patriarch and that he's in exile within Turkey. He says he's, he's in a sort of imposed from without, sure, but mm. he's in a kind of exiled position where he can speak the truth. Whereas yeah. when I look at the Moscow patriarch, it, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to pretend like I understand Russian politics beyond what I really do. But mm. I have a suspicion that had patriarch Kirill stood up and said, no, this is unacceptable. We're not going to make a war against our brothers in Ukraine. That he would be found in the Neva or something like this. He would be found, uh, you know, uh, oh, something happened to him, right? Yes. And they- rather than attain to martyrdom, he accepted to comply with the dictates of the state, right? And I just think any any claim of weakness against Bartholomew 
can be applied tenfold to Kirill, no? Like, I mean, he's completely beholden. Oh, sorry. I, do not get me wrong. This is not me. Uh, I'm not I, trying to put it on you. I'm just saying just, hypothetically uh, to think it through, to talk it through together. Yeah, I wasn't. Yeah, I believe they're apples and pears. I was just basically saying that despite disagreeing immensely with Moscow, I can see why people have an issue sometimes with Constantinople. I assume. Um, I do. I'm trying to be fa- fairly fair-handed. Um, I do. I actually agree with what you say that I think Kirill uh, would have, at the very least, found be discovered with you know prostitutes in his room or whatever it would be that something that enforced his resignation, shall we say, and that would be at the nice end of the spectrum. Uh, otherwise, as you say, ending up in a river. Um, but I think, I think for me, and this is something we touched on uh, in our own chat in the before the introduction, which is, I think we are now right now discussing the strengths or weaknesses of patriarchates and their own internal politics. But for me, the one beauty of um, Constantinople, if you like, is that it reigns as a kind of imaginary city in Mm. an imaginary world um which is the byzantine world um which is real because we all share the same faith Mm -hmm. okay and i think that should be a city-based religion and that everything that has occurred in the low point of the patriarchate of constantinople which is essentially for me 16th to 19th centuries um there's, there's famous Greek theologians like Yonaras and people like that who are superb, and I, I implore people to read him because he just shows that essentially orthodoxy lost its heart, uh, its confidence in its own theology, and essentially started to imitate uh, Catholic and Protestant theologies. And it kind of emptied out and bastardized its own traditions. And part and parcel of that was creating all of this kind of national autocephaly as the Ottoman Empire started to uh, go from a sick man to a dead man. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think this, to me, it sounds very abstract to a lot of people, and I don't blame them, but it's a very concrete example of why we are having this conversation, why the discourse is framed how it is today within nations, the kind of squabbling. You know, in my piece, I had Serbia... Um, backing its Slavic brother because it's essentially been paid off or polit- feels politically in hock to Russia. I think this whole thing of who's in whose pocket is because we are talking about nations as the rubric mm-hmm. rather than for what I believe should be the case is cities. Um, mm. I believe cities evaporate this idea that um, nas- uh, national identity I think national identity morphs far too quickly into pride and that has to be antithetical to Christianity. I believe cities foster a sense of belonging without um, without descending into xenophobia and therefore I believe they are more perfect vessels for Christianity. And it's, I think it's incontrovertible that the development of civilization in general in the West over the last, I don't know, thousand years that developed, you know, the rise and sort of obsolescence of the nation as a concept, we can't theologically just glom on to historical accident. You know, something was propitious or useful at a certain time, given the the reality on the ground, and it's no longer, yeah. you know, useful. I, I think that makes sense. I guess really quickly before we end, something I've struggled with personally, to be perfectly honest, is how do we respond? And as I mentioned before the introduction, Uh, I'm meeting Ukrainian people every single day at this point, and it is an incredibly disturbing situation. And obviously we pray for our enemies, we pray for our friends, we pray for the killers, we pray for the victims, we pray for everybody. But you've evoked uh, previously that people should break commune with Patriarch Kirill. Mm -hmm. I think beyond that, especially as laymen, such as we are, what, what do you think if you were to speak to other people? I mean, I know we're both uh, somehow attached to the sort of Russian tradition within orthodoxy. If you were speaking to other people in the West, listening to this, 
what, what, what should they do? How should they respond given the, I mean, I, I don't know what else to call it except the spirit of antichrist that is uh, poisoning and destroying our community from within. I guess it would try to turn a lot of the negatives of the discourse, which is, you know, this is crap or these people are horrible into what do you want? Who do you love? How are you going to make it happen? Um, I think you just, the, the real spirit of Christianity is kind of almost not answering evil. It's kind of working past it um, and developing a kind of a discourse that doesn't engage in a way. It doesn't respect the parameters that are set out by violence and ignorance and pride. It just, essentially, I think you, you know, there's actually been a lot of shameful acts that where people, um, a lot of the <laughs> home counties in England peculiarly uh, are kind of uh, vandalizing Russian churches and things like that. And I actually don't believe, I believe that's very counterproductive. I think if anything, it alienates people. I think this, the answer, and it's very dull to most people, but only dull because so few of us actually make it happen is the answer, is the gospel. You have to love Russians, you have to love Ukrainians, and you have to make sure that love doesn't remain a word. It kind of is is how you are and who it becomes who you are. Um, which might sound a bit new agey and a bit bit cringe in many ways, but I think the words are very easy to say. The actions are very hard to do. Oh, well, I think that's a, a perfect place to end. I want to thank you again, Henry, for joining us. Thank you. I will uh, include in the episode description a link to your article in The Critic, which is entitled Russian Orthodoxy on Trial, Symphonia or Caesar of Papism.